Today in reading class, we are going to read chapter 10 together at noon. And then after that, your only homework in reading is to read chapter 11. And I know this book uh, has some harder words, so I'm going to read it for you. You can either follow along on the screen or you can pull out your book and um, read along with me. Chapter 11, My Grace is Sufficient. The war went on. Outside the gates of Bei Chai Chuang, the trees put forth the buds of early spring. The heavy snows of winter melted, again making travel through the high mountain passes possible. Away day, away day, the cry came from the gate. Gladys was needed. This time, a convert near Chin Shui had been attacked by bandits. He had sent a messenger to bring Gladys. Ninepence, Gladys called to the young girl who appeared around the corner of the farmhouse, chasing two giggling, mud-covered little boys. Yes, mother? Ninepence caught the boys by the collars of their padded coats and held on tightly. Breathing hard, she hauled the squirming boys over to Gladys. Gladys frowned at the boys. Precious bundle, just look at you. And you, Chang, you're covered with mud. What have you been into? Farmer Louise Pigpen, Ninepence panted. They let the shoats out and they are rooting up the tender new shoots of wheat. She didn't have to say more. The distant shrieks of both man and piglets told Gladys how well, or rather how badly, the recapture was going. And I want to make a connection here. If you didn't know what a shoat was, this context clue tells you. It's a piglet. The boys let the piglets out and they were eating the new wheat growing. You, precious bundle, you, Chang, Gladys spoke sharply. Go catch those shoats and then go to the hospital. The Bible woman will see that you are dealt with this afternoon. Laughter gone, the two boys looked at Gladys solemnly and then turned to walk away. Wait, Gladys said. She held out, out her arms as the two boys turned around. I'm going to Chin Shui for a while. You two boys must obey the Bible woman while I'm gone. Precious Bundle threw his arms around her. I am sorry, mother, he said tearfully. We won't do it again, and we'll help catch the baby pigs, won't we, Chang? Chang nodded, leaning on Gladys's shoulder. Gladys gave them a hug and let them go. They ran off in the direction of the wheat fields. May I go with you this time, mother? Ninepence asked. Gladys shook her head. Not this time, Ninepence. The Bible woman needs you in Suolan to help with the children, unless must help in the hospital. Timothy will go with me. Have you seen him? Yes, mother, Ninepence replied. He is playing with some of the other boys under the grape arbors. I will get him for you. Gladys started to back up the steps to her room. Then she stopped, ran down, and hurried to the hospital. Les was carefully rolling torn cloth to be used as bandages. Gladys watched him for a minute. Quiet all his life. Les had grown into a serious 12-year-old, responsible enough to help at tasks usually assigned to the older children. He looked up as Gladys stepped into the cave. Les, Gladys said softly, trying not to disturb the patients. I'm leaving for a while. Ninepence knows and so do some of the others. Help keep an eye on the younger ones. They are getting too wild lately. Les smiled. The warm winds of spring have stirred their spirits, he said. Yes, I will watch out for them. I'll be back as soon as I can, Gladys said. Goodbye, Les. Goodbye, Mother. Don't worry about us. We'll be all right. Gladys smiled and walked quietly over to a 17-year-old girl bending over a cot. Come, Wan Yu. Gladys motioned her outside. I'm going to Chin Shui. Your family lives some miles from there, don't they? Wan Yu nodded. Would you like to go with us? We would take you up. On to visit your mother, Gladys continued. Oh yes, away day, Wan Yu replied happily. Three people left Bei Chai Chuang that afternoon. Gladys carried her medicine. 
one you walked behind, beside her, and nine-year-old Timothy ran up the trail ahead of them, hitting the rocks with a stick he had picked up. Near Chin Shui, they reached the convert's house. Gladys bandaged his wounds, and they stayed with him for almost a week. Then Gladys insisted that they must go on to the town of Chin Shui, and then to Wan Yu's village. After a winter inside the village gates, walking was a pleasure. The newly plowed and planted earth was a patchwork, was patchworked by terraced fields. Timothy darted from one side of the road to the other, discovering treasures, a frog, a grasshopper, or unusual stones unearthed by the farmer's plows. Sometimes Gladys stopped to speak to the men as they worked, one plowing and one pulling the plow. Have you seen any Japanese? Gladys asked. The men shook their heads. Not yet, they answered, but no doubt they will be here soon. The men hurried back to their plowing, trying to get as much work in as possible before the planes came again. Gladys, Wan Yu, and Timothy went on. The first night on the road, they were caught in a thunderstorm and had to stop at an inn. Heavy spring rain drummed on the tile roof as the travelers slept. The next morning, the roads were slippery with mud. When the roads had dried out, they went on. Timothy amused himself by throwing mud balls at the scrawny bushes alongside the road. They had only gone a few miles before planes began to roar overhead. Throwing themselves flat on the ground, they covered their heads. In the distance, they heard the explosion of bombs. Wan Yu raised her head to look at Gladys. The Japanese are bombing Chin Shui. Gladys nodded grimly. Chin Shui was still a day's journey by walking. If the rain and mud hadn't delayed them, they would be in the midst of those falling bombs. We must hurry. They will need help. After the bombing, Gladys said, they scrambled to their feet and hurried down the road. At Chin Chui, they found a familiar scene. The villagers hurried about, preparing to flee into the mountains. Foot soldiers attacked, and the villagers fled to the safety of the harsh mountain ranges. When the soldiers left the villages, the villagers crept out of their hiding places and rebuilt their towns. Again and again, this was repeated. Gladys understood the villagers' desire to keep small patches of land that they could call their own. Early in the war, she had written home, Do not wish me out of this or, or in any way seek to get me out, for I will not be got out while this trial is on. These are my people. God has given them to me, and I will live or die with them for him and his glory. Boys and girls, we need to pause here because this is the title of the book. And this is the reason that Gladys spoke those words. These are my people. God has given them to me. So she is saying that even in a time of war, don't try to get me to leave this place. These are my people. As the three travelers joined the fleeting villagers, the postmaster saw them. Away day, he called frantically. As Gladys reached him, he thrust a large brown paper bundle into her hands. These letters are for you, he said hurriedly. They were sent on from Yang Cheng. My stamps and documents are in there too. Will you keep them for me? Gladys agreed quickly and the postmaster disappeared into the crowded street. Gladys clutched the long-awaited letters from home and hurried to the mission. There they gathered up all the Bibles they could carry and then joined the mass of people swarming through the village's west gate. Three hundred yards down the road from the gate, Gladys, Wan Yu, and Timothy followed the villagers into the swiftly flowing Li River. The rushing water was chest deep on Gladys she balanced her precious letters on her head and clutched Timothy with one hand. Wan Yu struggled along behind them, holding the bundles of Bibles high. On the other side, they hurried up the steep slope to the mountains where Wan Yu's mother lived. Behind them, they heard the crank, the crack of rifle fire 
as the Japanese entered the city, so they just got out in time again. There were no paths up the side of the mountain. They struggled up through terraced fields of millet. All day they climbed upward. Wanyu's village was almost at the top. Only one village lay beyond it. In Wanyu's house lived her mother, her brother, and his wife. A few hours after Gladys, Timothy, and Wanyu arrived, they were joined by brothers fleeing the walled city below. Gladys could not return through Chin Shui to Bei Chai Chuang. Trusting the Bible woman and the older children to take care of her huge family there, Gladys settled down to work at the village. Once again, she started a small hospital and prayed that the Japanese would come no closer. Almost every day, the Japanese would leave Chin Shui and attack the seven villages that lay along the river. At nightfall, they returned to Chin Shui and barred the gates. Under cover of the darkness, Gladys and the farmers would creep down and help the wounded. Five weeks later, the Japanese began to raid the villages farther up the mountain. Oh no. With sinking heart, Gladys knew that it would only be a matter of time before they reached Wan Yu's village. One afternoon, Gladys was tending a sick woman in the room upstairs. She heard Wan Yu's shrill scream, They're here! They're here! Quickly, Gladys ran downstairs and across the courtyard to a small hole cut in the courtyard wall. She saw khaki-clad figures moving up the terraced fields. Wan Yu's house was the first in the village. There could be no escape. Hide, she shouted to Wan Yu. I'll try to keep them out. Gladys ran to the front gate. Oh God, she said, leaning against the gate. Perhaps if they see a foreign devil, they will be so surprised they will forget about the others. I don't know what to do. Please help me. Into the fear and confusion of her mind came a verse. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Gladys stood, stood straight and pushed open the heavy doors. She stepped outside expecting to hear gunfire. Instead, she heard Wan Yu's voice calling from the balcony, balcony. Away day! They've turned back! They're going away! The Japanese never came back to Wan Yu's village. In late summer, they moved back into the larger cities, away from the mountain ranges where they could be trapped by the heavy snow. Gladys returned to Bei Chai Chuang. Her growing family of refugee children had grown too large for this small mountain village. Leaving the Bible woman in charge of the hospital, Gladys moved back to Yang Cheng, taking the children with her. They wound down the mountainside and through the streets of the city of Yang Cheng, greeting old friends as they went. At the Inn of the Eight Happinesses, the children swarmed into the courtyard. It had been almost two years since the children had seen their home. The new children explored the rooms of the inn as the others found old possessions, precious bundles, broken toy, a favorite book belonging to Les. Ninepence looked for the old cat, but he was never seen again. The winter settled in again, heaping snow into the courtyard and sending the children inside to the warm gangs. It was spring again when Gladys met the Chinese nationalist leaders. In passing, she mentioned to one of them that she saw Japanese troops in her travels. The soldiers asked her to tell them where the Japanese were. Surprised, Gladys did so. Hesitant at first, Gladys came to realize that this was another way to help her people, the people of China. I would help if this were England, she thought. I am Chinese now. This is my country. I'll help them in any way I can. Sometimes Gladys passed the troops on her journeys from one church to another. As time passed, some of the Japanese Christians came to her services, 
having heard of the storyteller from the villagers. Gladys watched and listened, and as she moved across the mountains from village to village, she remembered everything she saw. The reports she gave the Chinese army saved the lives of many villagers. Remembering what had happened to Si Lian's family, Gladys realized that her activities, her activities of helping the Chinese soldiers, might put the children in danger. Arrangements were made to send half of them away. 100 of the children left with Mr. Liu for the long trip to Siam. One night, a, Chinese, a young Chinese soldier knocked on the door of the mission where Gladys was teaching. You are in danger, he warned. The Japanese that you have, know that you have been giving us information, they've put a price on your head, he told her. They're looking for you now. Me? Gladys murmured in shock. Here, the soldier handed Gladys a tattered handbell, a piece of paper. Read it for yourself. Holding the small handbill up to the lamp lamplight, she read, $100 reward. $100 reward will be paid by the Japanese army for information leading to the capture, alive, of any of the three people listed below. Gladys stared at the three names. The first two were important men of Si Chao. The third line read, The small woman known as Away Day. Thank you, Gladys whispered to the dark figure in the doorway. Thank you for warning me. The soldier nodded and left quietly. Gladys turned the paper over and over in her hands. I can't leave, she thought. What about nine pence less, precious bundle? What about all my children? Only half the children had been sent to safety in Siam. Horrified, she thought of the last hundred children that were still gathered at the inn of the eight happinesses. I can't leave them. By morning she realized that she would be no help to anyone if she were captured. I'll take the children with me, she thought, rolling her belongings into a tight bundle. As she reached the front gate of the mission, she heard pounding. Open up, called the Japanese. Open up! Gladys turned and ran. Out the back gate she sped. As she raced through the graveyard, she heard shouts behind her, and then the whine of a bullet as it glanced off a tombstone. Gladys dodged. She bent over and ran from tombstone to tombstone. She dashed for the safety of a deep ditch. But just as she reached the ditch, she was hit by a bullet. Gladys twisted and fell on the brink of the ditch. Her crumpled figure lay still, just short of safety. But you can't wait to see what happens in chapter 12. I'll read that one with you tomorrow in our conference. Have a great day, boys and girls.